going on today and uh, in the uh, Capitol, too, is they're trying to wrap up their 60-day legislative session. A uh, gigantic wrench was thrown into the budget plans uh, recently when the uh, federal government decided that to like about half a billion dollars back <laughs> for some of those uh, COVID funds. Uh, no problem. Just uh, look under the couch uh, for that. A uh, couple, couple of quarters, a dime, a nickel. What do you got on you there, Matt? <laughs> A, a but, couple of nickels. <laughs> That's, so, uh, who carries cash now? I think, uh, <laughs> in, in California, they'd be happy to only have a half a half a billion dollar problem and not a thirty billion dollar problem. Yeah. So uh, anyway, did we not see this coming? Well, let's ask. No. Let's ask Delegate Larry Cup. <laughs> he, he joins us via telephone. Larry, good morning, sir. Good morning, and for sure and for certain, may God bless you all real good. Thank you kindly. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, there, and uh, Larry, uh, the quick question is that Matt asked, did we see this coming, this uh, this federal government request for almost a half a billion dollars in return funds? No, it was it was sort of a surprise. The good news is we've got a real healthy rainy day fund, so if worst comes comes to pass, we're still going to be all right. The bad news is it's going to cause us to have a real bare bones budget by the at the end of the session, and we'll go back in May for a special session to take care of things after this is resolved. Is there a date set for that special session in May yet, Larry? Uh, it hasn't been set. The governor declares that, but uh, the, the interim sessions are already scheduled for the 19th of, to the 21st of May. So I would bet donuts to dollars that the uh, special session will be in that time frame as well. That would make the most sense. So uh, what the federal government, as I've read this, the claim is that the state did not use the funds in the appropriate ratio for education versus other categories. Is that as you understand it, Larry? No, I, my understanding is somewhat different. My understanding is that the problem was with the county, the county school boards, and of course the state is ultimately responsible for that, so it still comes back in the lap of the state. Oh, so this goes to the county school board level, not directed spending at the state level with the governor deciding where funds go and such? That's my understanding, though it's my also understanding that uh, – House Majority Leader Eric Householder is coming on later this morning to talk to you. He knows so much more than I do about that. All right. Yeah, we, we have a conversation scheduled with him that also will deal with the uh, revenue numbers from February as well. And that's with Eric at 9 o'clock this morning. Delegate Mike Height, you might uh, want to know, follows you this morning uh, too, Larry. Well, he's a good – I'm a good man for him to follow. Yeah, I think so. He's on the uh, – I think Mike is on the Finance Committee too, is he not? Yeah, Mike's on the Finance Committee, so he also would have some inside information on that. All right, let's uh, – hey, I want to talk about the uh, – I don't know if you heard the opening there with the professor from uh, WVU and their uh, Pediatrics Infectious Diseases Specialist Division there. And talking about the vaccine vote that the House took recently, uh, I think your name was on that bill as one of the co-sponsors, was it not? It was, absolutely. I was proud to do that. So tell me about this bill and uh, what, what is the, uh, the need for it in terms of repealing well, some of the restraints of the vaccine laws in the state? It, it's a freedom bill. Uh, now, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Uh, but I do believe in individual choice. If someone chooses not to get vaccinated, uh, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, they, they can deal with the issue as it is. Uh, if you're not vaccinated, the others that are vaccinated should be uh, reasonably healthy uh, and not have a problem with that. Uh, of course, this whole issue came to the surface with all the uh, awful things that happened with COVID, uh, which we can go into that, but that would take forever. But uh, I think it's perfectly reasonable for someone to have a choice as to not to be vaccinated. In fact, in my mind, it's a Fourth Amendment issue, uh, which allows people to be secure in their own persons. So we're not talking about the COVID vaccine here, though. We're talking about childhood immunizations, measles, mumps, rubella, smallpox, that sort of vaccination, not the COVID vaccination, correct? We're talking about all vaccinations. All vaccinations. Did you... Consult with any medical experts. Did the House hear any medical experts testify in regards to your thoughts about the vaccines and whether well, they should be mandatory? 
I'm not a doctor or a medical expert, and I don't play one on TV, but I am interested in this, and I've done a lot of listening uh, to people uh, on the issue. Uh, had a lot of feedback from nurses and doctors in our local area, uh, and I've also uh, had a conversation with a retired ep- epidemiologist uh, from Fort Ritchie, and uh, the epidemiologist, for instance, told me um, a lot of the things about va- vaccines, which uh, is, are claims that are, that are just bogus. But essentially, uh, what it boils down to, if you choose, and I and, and I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I've had every I've had every vaccine that you could possibly have. I've had the COVID vaccine all four times. Though the last experience I had almost put me in the hospital and maybe in the grave uh, with the with the after effects. But uh, if you choose not to be vaccinated, uh, the uh, uh, those who are vaccinated should not have any worries about being infected by whatever you catch. Uh, so it's 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 a matter of let people make their own choices, and I'm perfectly okay with that. Larry, I would say that's a perfectly reasonable position to take, with it, except for the interviews I did this week where the medical experts I spoke with completely disagree with what you just said, that that's not necessarily mm-hmm. true. And that would be Dr. McLaughlin from the health department, the uh, chief pediatric infections disease specialist at WVU, and uh, Bill Kearns locally from the health department. That was my understanding as well, that if you have been vaccinated for measles, mumps, rubella, whatever, you're fine. It's the other person's issue. If they get that, then that's, that's kind of how the cookie crumbles. But that doesn't appear to be the case, actually. Well, um, that concerns me. The, that concerns me. That's, 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 that's their opinion. I, 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 quite frankly, I just, I just don't believe that. Uh, I, and also, I believe that those who chose not to be vaccinated are going to be a very small minority of the population. And I think the herd... Uh, immunization uh, with the vaccinations uh, w- will certainly be adequate. In fact, during COVID, I was watching what our state and other states did and the country did. Um, and I was interested to me that the, the nation of Sweden uh, did almost nothing uh, in regard to what we were doing. And they their mortality rate uh, was just about the same as the other nations i think yeah this isn't about things. covid though larry i'm not talking about the two vaccines no, are completely know, but different vac- but vaccines are vaccines uh no and, the covid uh, vaccine they, is different than the vaccines for measles mumps and rubella that's sci- they're scientifically different they're, they're different diseases that's right uh but uh and i've had measles i've had mumps i've had chicken pox i've had the, the whole the whole whole nine yards but uh uh, I, I I absolutely dis, dis, disagree with an, an agency, a government, saying that you have to be, be vaccinated. In fact, West Virginia, uh, and they brag about this, has more vaccination mandates than any other state in the nation. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's one of the things we're best at, such as obesity, unemployment, things of that nature. Uh, and I just think it's a freedom of choice issue. As a result of that strict vaccine mandate, though, we have zero cases of those diseases in the state. Other other states uh, have, uh, have have mandates and and they've had problems. Uh, I I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. You don't you don't uh, believe I, 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 you don't believe medical experts about vaccinations. I think vac- uh, medical medical experts have their own opinions. Those opinions are not necessarily uh, uh, based uh, based in. In, in in science, it's uh, of course they are. That, that, well, that, that's, that's what your res- opinion. That's My a- opinion is different. Hey, Larry, it's Jonathan. It's not an opinion. Okay. There's a difference between opinion is the movie was good. No, the movie was terrible. Right. The opinion is not vaccinations eradicated smallpox. That's not an opinion. That's fact. Mm-hmm. Well, I this well, is Larry. This is Jonathan. Now, hey, I got to. Right. I mean, as far as the COVID vaccine goes. It was something that did not keep people from getting it. It, it the way I mean the way it was set up, it supposedly lessened the blow. And I'm not going to go into anything about the COVID vaccines. Right, right, right. right. But the measles, mumps, and rubella, the childhood vaccines keep people from actually getting those diseases. It prevents those diseases. Smallpox killed millions. I mean, it, throughout the world. I mean, there are, and we've had, I don't know what state it is, but there have been a number of states this year where they've had measles outbreaks in areas where they have not had 
um, where they have not had extreme vax, where they have not had all the kids vaccinated. I mean, I'm 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 sort of siding with Rob here because right. I mean, these childhood vaccines have been studied forever, proven forever, and have shown to not have side effects. For you know, I mean, I'm I'm 55 years old. I had all the vaccines. Right. I mean, I, I look at that as a public health issue, and I look to the public. There, there's enough empirical data that says, hey, these things got rid of these diseases, like polio, for example. I mean, polio has been wiped out in all but a few countries. Rotary has done a lot with that. But without mm-hmm. that, you know, kids were getting polio. We had the iron lungs. We had all that. I mean, they, there are different degrees. I mean, the, the COVID vaccine's a lot like the flu vaccine you get the vaccine it doesn't keep you from getting it it just lessens the blow what i mean what what sort of medical experts did you uh did you talk with were they were they people who were renowned were they nationally renowned what what sort of qualifications did they have except for the guy at fort ritchie and fort ritchie's an amazing place of course it is it is now the fellow i talked to the retired epidemiologist at fort ritchie he was talking about the covid vaccine specifically not not vaccines in general uh and i'm very pro vaccine uh i've taken all the vaccines that were there since a child as an adult and i if if there's a choice that somebody make i would say take the vaccine but if someone chooses not to take the vaccine i think that's a freedom of choice issue and i think they have the right to do that well larry again um my fear on this is, I know Matt had a bad reaction to vaccines as a kid. Uh, my oldest son had a uh, re- reaction to one to the point where they told him he shouldn't get the second one. Uh, the issue with religious freedom is you guys didn't put any guardrails on it. Anybody can claim it, uh, whether it's legit or not. So in the situation where my oldest son, who wasn't fully vaccinated, uh, should there be an outbreak, he could be at risk. Matt could be at risk if there's an outbreak of these uh, diseases once again in West Virginia. Uh, if, you mm-hmm. have, if you have a legitimate religious objection to this, uh, I, I know that's a very small percentage of the population, but there's, right. a, there's another percentage of the population who watches YouTube and gets their science from YouTube. And they look exactly. at that and they go, well, you know what? Uh, I'm going to grow a third head. I, I can't get this. Or the, the immunocompromised. I'll, I'll get autism, uh, which has been debunked. Right. But there's a right. lot of people that right. believe that. So th- this is my That's concern. It's, it's, not the, it's not the 1% of people out there who have a legitimate religious objection to a vaccine. It's the others who will use the excuse of a religious exemption when they don't really believe that. You are correct in, in the fact that the, the, the proposal as written doesn't require any criteria on a religious exception. But my freedom issue goes beyond religious objections. I think anyone, regardless of your religious affiliation or opinion, who doesn't want to be vaccinated should have that choice. Uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a freedom of choice issue, even though vaccines, in my opinion, are helpful uh, and they do help the safety of the safe, safety of the nation. The vast majority of people are going to get vaccinated. Those who choose not to be vaccinated, I think that's their choice as well, and they should suffer the consequences. What What about lead paint? Are you okay with people just putting lead paint in houses? That's a choice. Yes, it is. It is a choice. Uh, I don't believe that uh, lead 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 paint is. Uh, available anymore uh, years after years and years ago because people unknowingly were using lead, lead paint. Now they know, and now it's not, now it's not marketed. Well, I think that's opinion. I, I, I don't think lead paint's bad for you. That's my opinion. Uh, Matt Miller. So there are four people that are a part of this conversation, and we hear the banter back and forth and the questions being raised. What has the reception been uh, in the legislature, and where do you see this going? Well, um, I, I, it's going to pass the the the, the, uh, the the House of Delegates. What happens in the Senate uh, is up in the air. Uh, we'll see what happens there. Let's say it passes the House of Delegates in the Senate. Then there's also the issue of whether or not the governor signs it. Did you get this same type of debate? Uh, it- in in the 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 house uh, whether it was through, from committee to get out to the house to the house as a whole um w- was there this same kind of banner back and forth yes there was 
Larry, I want to talk about your vehicular homicide bill. Uh, this is a bill that we agree on 100%. Have you had any success mm-hmm. getting HB 5119 through? No, uh, and it's been very frustrating. Uh, and uh, some of the people that are most seriously affected by this, that have been victims of it, uh, are, are very upset. But uh, we, I have, unfortunately, I've not been able to get a, a hearing in the House. Uh, there was um, a very mild version of it that passed the Senate, but uh, been working real hard trying to get a hearing in the Judiciary Committee in the House. And so far, we just haven't been able to budget. What is the hang-up? Do you have any idea? I don't know. Uh, I get a very courteous response from the committee chair. He says, I I see all the information. I'll take a look at it. But uh, other than that, crickets. Uh, As the law stands now, Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, if I am, am drag racing down the street and I lose control of my vehicle and on the side of the road or a couple of kids uh, playing in their yard, I skid into the yard and, and wipe out one of the kids, killing the kid. Mm-hmm. Right now, mm-hmm. the, my maximum sentence is six months to a year? That's right. It's only a misdemeanor. And and, and that's the issue. Uh, and it's not that, well, it's just that I remember years ago, and this is a situation in other jurisdictions as well, when I was dealing with inmates uh, who were serving a long time, Long sentences, sentences for uh, for for uh, for various forms of murder. I said, you know, I, I said if you would run over somebody with a vehicle, um, you would have a much lesser sentence. And I just don't think that the crime fits the sentence. Yeah, we are in agreement on that. Is there a companion bill in the Senate? If you mentioned that already, I missed it. My apologies. Senate Bill 163 uh, was was passed by the Senate uh, by an almost I think. A, Almost, if not a unanimous vote, it is still it is now pending in the in the House Judiciary Committee. But so far, the committee has not budged on uh, at least the chairman has not budged on giving it a hearing. Good. I just wanted to ask: is is there a question around maybe raising that penalty? The issue of of say accidental vehicular homicide. In other words, someone is is traveling and you know the, by the blinding light, the direction of the road is is putting the sun right in their eyes. They didn't recognize that that light had changed from uh, green to yellow to red, and they run that red light, and there's an accident. As opposed to someone who's deliberately drag racing and being reckless, is that part of the issue, or does this bill specifically state that there has to be uh, a purposeful reason, say, behind the vehicular homicide? Uh, the, the bill just says it's accidental. If, if, it, if there's any intention of purpose, then that raises it to another level automatically. Okay. Um, we've had three uh, staff attorneys uh, get together and draft the bill. Uh, I, I think it's well well reasoned uh, of course if when and if we have a committee hearing there's further discussion on it because we have lots of attorneys that are also uh, serving on these legislative committees but uh, it really concerns me that we haven't been able to get a committee hearing on this issue and how much higher does it raise the stakes from six months to a I'm, year to i have to look at it but uh, i think it, it it off the top of my head the bill's not in front of me i, I think it raises it to uh, up to five to t- five or ten years which still is not a big slice of time for for taking somebody's life and that's just if there was that that's not for accidental i mean if that's, it's that's for anything you could be you could be distracted by fooling with your radio you could be doing anything but you know when you're dead you're dead Larry, HB 4887, reducing the term of office for Berkeley County commissioners from six years to four years. Did that get anywhere? No, didn't get anywhere, which does not surprise me. I think it's a good idea uh, to to reduce that term from six years to four years, but uh, there simply wasn't any buy-in on that at all, uh, uh, particularly by county commissioners throughout the state and also by legislators. So I was uh, a... uh, Lone wo- a lone voice in the wilderness on this one. Your your bill was uh, specific to Berkeley County, though, was it not? It was, and I, I was trying to 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 narrow it down. Though I I think it would do well for all counties, but I didn't want to speak for all counties. I just wanted to deal with Berkeley County because I think six years to four years makes it more accessible to the voters. Uh, for instance, if the voters are upset with a any given county commissioner. Uh, 
or the, the actions of a county commission, only a couple of them will come up every year. If they come up uh, even staggered uh, on a four-year basis, I just think that's more accountability to the voters. But I knew the bill wasn't going to go anywhere, but I put the, put the bill in anyway because uh, it was just the right thing to do. Uh, Single-member Senate districts, did that get any juice? None, none whatsoever, uh, though the, the, the interest in that is building. Uh, so that's one of those issues, like with a lot of bills, you have to uh, put, in the, put in the bill, get the idea percolated around, and sometimes it takes several years uh, to, to get the bill actually come to fruition. In regards to the bare bones budget, can we assume that uh, pretty much any bill that has a fiscal note at this time is not going to advance until we get this federal clawback fixed? <clears throat> I wouldn't make that as a blanket assumption, but it's going to really, uh, really cause the legislature to think long and hard before making any increases at all. Fortunately, we've got a very healthy rainy day fund and, and surplus. But still, if you're going to take oh, about a half a billion dollars uh, possibly uh, out of the budget, it makes them think long and hard, makes all of us think long and hard before we pass any spending measures. So my prognosis is that the budget is going to be very bare bones, uh, and then we'll look at the other spending issues that are optional um, for the legislature. We'll look at that in May. Larry, how much is in the rainy day fund, just out of curiosity? About a billion dollars. So that would wipe out half of it. Yeah, and then, of course, we also have the budget surplus, which is on top of that. Which, last check, was a little over $400 million, Larry, if I remember? Yes. All right, very good. I, can I assume that there will, at this time, be no passage of a pay increase for state employees? Well, that's up in the air. I would suspect not at this time, but keep in mind that the fiscal year doesn't start till July, so we still have plenty of time to look at that in May. Is that due to the possible drawback of these funds by the federal government? Is that what's kind of, of nixing that idea? It's nixing any spending uh, ideas of, of any consequence, except for some minor, you know, minor issues here and there that have to be made and adjusted for other kinds of reasons. But any spending is under the microscope now because of that possibility of the clawback. Darn it, I guess that's going to stop locality pay here in the eastern panhandle for this year. That didn't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Larry, there are a couple yeah. things on your list you wanted to make sure you got to as well. Did we uh, miss any of those in our discussion? Uh, well, a couple, couple, couple things, uh, which is, is an ongoing battle and ongoing. Uh, the uh, certificate of need, uh, which has been a battle over the years that uh, – essentially gives health providers and hospitals essentially a monopoly. Uh, my wife pointed out to me that, you know, the initials of certificate of need are C-O-N, CON, uh, which uh, we don't think is fair. We think there ought to be much com more competition in the health field, care field. Uh, also, the tele telemedicine ought to be expanded and broadened uh, so that there's more accessible uh, uh, comparability uh, between us and, and other states; those are those are issues that uh, are are certainly important. Uh, Cindy Barnhart Galt, who you might know, Larry, um, my son was killed 20 years ago by an 18-year-old driving 55 and a 35 crossed the line, killed him instantly. He didn't even get a speeding ticket. Exactly, exactly. Wow. I mean, it's a horrendous Sad. thing. When I talk to constituents or anybody around the state. And I tell them that's the situation with vehicular homicide. They say, are you sure? That can't be true. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 it's just a travesty of justice. Yeah, it is. Uh, back to certificate of need. I know you were on one time with Bill and uh, Marie at the same time, and they talked to you about a carve-out for hospice. Uh, and I think, right. I think you had made mention of the fact that you would look further into that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that now, Larry? Well, I, I would look at that further. The big issues are, are, are the big hospitals, not, not hospice. And the hospice in East Japan does a really good job. I was over there several times. I did a tour of the facility. It struck me that uh, the, the, the directors of that agency make pretty big salaries. And God forbid that I was ever in a hospice <laughs> situation. My dad was uh, and actually had to stay there. But the, the, the accommodations there for the for the for the dying patients are better than a five star hotel. Uh, I uh, I'm I'm still going to look at that carefully. That'll probably probably be the last issue we look at as certificate of need. But uh, 
I still think that competition brings things better. In the 70s, the federal government had certificate of need because they thought it would reduce costs uh, and improve quality of care. It did neither. The federal government got rid of it. Most states have either gotten rid of it or modified it. West Virginia is one of the, the few that's lagging in this regard. Larry, you had said something about high salaries. What, what do you consider a high salary in this area, in the eastern panhandle? Well, anything, anybody that makes more than I do is, is a high salary. But uh, <laughs> uh, legislators make $20,000 a year. Uh, but uh, any, anything over, you know, uh, yeah. A high salary to 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 me, uh, a comfortable salary is sixty to eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. But some people are making much more than that. Here in Joe Biden's America, sir, you can't live on sixty to eighty thousand really, uh, really that comfortably. It unfortunately, depends. well, it de- it depends. Somebody told me many years ago that interest never sleeps and never takes a vacation. So don't get into <laughs> debt. Possibly can possibly afford it, and always spend less than you make. And I took that advice very late in life, but uh, it's amazing. My wife is disabled, and and I'm retired uh, on Social Security, and it's amazing how well we can do just by being careful how we spend things. That's cool. Well, that's a great attitude to have, and those are that's great advice, especially for our younger people. Appreciate your time this morning. Always a pleasure speaking with you, sir. Thank you.